experimental data. Thank you very much, John. So, Brian, can you see the screen? So, thanks to John and Brian for uh, making the arrangement for uh, for PDB to participate in the workshop and making all the remote communication arrangements. The streaming of the, the meeting over YouTube is working very well. It's very clear. So I'd like to talk on a topic that's a little bit different prior to making the arrangement for, for PDB to participate in the workshop and making all the remote. So I hope you're not hearing an echo. I've, I've cut down my microphone. I'm, I'm hearing a, a very significant. I'm cutting off my uh, my stream. So at the moment you're coming across clearly on the audio. Okay, good. That's fine. So okay, uh, so I'm going to focus a little bit about talking about uh, the experimental data collected by the PDB, uh, the challenges uh, that we are confronting collecting uh, data at, uh, from the user community uh, and through our deposition interface across the whole PDB uh, structural biology uh, pipeline, at least uh, the view of that that the PDB sees, and uh, how we're addressing uh, some of the challenges that are uh, part of that. So to begin with, uh, I think everybody is familiar with the PDB. Uh, the molecule on the right uh, is what most of our end user community is interested in. Um, and. Uh, the, the majority of our use uh, now has shifted uh, from a depositor-centric uh, user community to uh, a much broader community of um, biologists and, and users in uh, related disciplines. So as we're discussing metadata uh, and interoperation among uh, groups using metadata, I think it's useful to point out that the PDB itself is a collaborative uh, organization among the partner sites that collect uh, depositions to the PDB uh, from uh, the group in the U.S., uh, the RCSB, uh, PDBJ in Osaka, and PDB in Hingston, and our NMR partner uh, in Wisconsin. And one of the key aspects of the collaboration, uh, as highlighted in red here, is the agreement to use a, uh, a common uh, metadata representation. And that was uh, the process of arriving at, the, at, at uh, that agreement uh, was something that took uh, more than uh, more than a few years, uh, and uh, but it's become the foundation for uh, our interaction with respect to how we process and manage the archive. So the archive continues to grow. Here we're looking at the uh, the number of depositions reflecting the product of much of the work of members of the audience, uh, and the use of the archive uh, is quite impressive. Uh, worldwide, uh, the number of downloads per year is of the order of 500 million. So the complexity of the archive continues to grow uh, here, represented in terms of molecular complexity, 
uh, in terms of the number of small molecules uh, and medium-sized molecules uh, within a PDB entry. Uh, perhaps the next time this workshop is uh, convened, uh, the complexity graph is going to reflect um, sort of the emerging uh, complexity that comes from uh, entries which uh, will be uh, based on uh, primary experimental data from uh, more than just a single method. So uh, what I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about what primary data looks like from the PDB perspective while this workshop has been or is focused very specifically on issues of uh, raw image data, I think it's important to keep in mind, particularly from the, uh, the protein uh, perspective, uh, that the sample is a very important component of uh, the primary data. And keeping track of the sample uh, and the metadata required to do that uh, is essential if you want to be able to uh, uh, have the opportunity to take advantage of uh, the products of the archiving uh, of more primary image data. The kinds of information that we try to acquire um, at deposition time include the details of composition, as accurate as possible chemical and molecular descriptions of all the components, uh, source organism production details and experimentally determined biological role if possible, and then uh, sample and specimen issues uh, such as crystallization conditions and any post-treatments. So we captured data collection information at a very uh, coarse level of detail compared to the to the level of detail that's been discussed so far in this workshop, largely in terms of instrumentation, uh, sample handling, uh, and, and data collection uh, protocols at a very high level. Uh, and then I think everyone would agree that uh, there are a few skeptics there are a few steps that are sort of left out of uh, PDB's pipeline, which is largely the subject of this workshop, which is um, the uh, raw image data that uh, is uh, contributed to the PDB after a significant amount of processing. So our view of the primary data, as I'm sure all of you know, is largely in terms of the summary statistics from data processing operations, the software steps that, uh, and the software tools that were used in that, um, and the process data itself. Currently in the archive, um, we have about 98% uh, of the X-ray entries uh, have structure factor amplitude data. Uh, this information has been mandatory at deposition since 2008. Uh, within the entries that contain uh, where we have structure factor data, um, it's been traditional to provide the final reflection data as the first uh, data set uh, in uh, potentially a multi-data set uh, SIF packaging, uh, about 10,000 Additional data sets uh, are available which variably contain uh, either derivative or multi-wavelength data sets, intermediate phasing data, map coefficients, and um, for a small number of cases, currently unmerged intensities. So if we shift a little bit to data acquisition from the perspective of the PDB, um, the model on the left, uh, which perhaps is the largest volume of the data, is actually the, um, is actually the most straightforward aspect of our data collection pipeline. Uh, the sample information that I've been discussing uh, 
is actually quite a bit, uh, quite a bit more challenging. Uh, our pipeline, as I said, is based on uh, for data collection and deposition is uh, is based on uh, the agreed metadata framework, which is uh, entirely instrumented uh, across the full pipeline and MMSIF. And as Herb was discussing in his talk, um, um, much of the work of packaging information for the pipeline is done um, via data harvesting operations. And particularly, and this is particularly the case for anything having to do with data collection. Um, we have, um, in the last year and a half, um, been uh, the benefit of a significant amount of work on behalf of the major protein refinement packages in delivering native MMSIF uh, data files uh, coming out of refinement to the deposition system. But that, that work doesn't include uh, any information related to, uh, or currently uh, related to, uh, predecessor steps in the pipeline. So sample information and information related to uh, uh, data collection uh, is, is, is largely the target of data harvesting operations. So we've, we've been working at this uh, harvesting tooling for some time. We provide uh, websites and software tools, some of which are already embedded in large packages uh, to do log file and output file harvesting. Uh, this is a very pragmatic approach, um, which we've had to take because of the lack of compliance with metadata. But I don't think this is a particularly good future direction to, uh, to adopt. It's a very high maintenance problem. So we do similar things with uh, process data. Most of this data comes to us in the form of binary packaged files, such as MTZ files. Uh, and that's all converted. Uh, data is extracted from those formats and put into uh, uh, SIF packaging for deposition. So the, one of the biggest challenges that we have with respect to uh, the more primary data is the data that we can't harvest ends up having to be manually input in the form of uh, through a web interface. Um, and this is um, certainly most true for data collection and uh, sample related information. So that problem is um, uh, the fact that we don't have a reliable electronic uh, vehicle for packaging metadata associated with the sample um, is a continuing problem for automating the whole deposition pipeline. Oh, we've made some progress in chemical assignment. The same similar issues exist there. Being able to uh, accurately define the chemical descriptions of all the sample components is essential and to be able to accurately represent the experiment and provide for reuse. Uh, we provide metadata to define all of the chemical components within the PDB archive, um, and we align incoming data according to that uh, data dictionary. This dictionary is embedded in most of the refinement uh, software packages, so progress is being made in standardizing this, uh, but there are still a ways to go to uh, encode all of the chemical information in a purely electronic form. Um, so just as a, a brief aside, uh, we collect all of this data and it's, uh, it does in fact uh, percolate up through the pipeline, particularly uh, we're trying to uh, uh, provide more diagnostics uh, and more accessible diagnostics of um, map model fit and electron density. Uh, this is an example from 
a uh, PDB validation report, which is um, which all depositors see and go to many journal reviewers. The red dots here indicate fitting uh, issues along the sequence. Uh, similarly, we provide diagnostics uh, on ligands. Uh, these are tools that are part of our annotation pipeline. So we're trying to uh, move the data up the pipeline and make it available to the end users uh, uh, as much as possible. So uh, now I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, what we're trying to do to uh, improve the pipeline from the perspective of data organization and metadata. As I mentioned, uh, we benefited greatly from the efforts of um, a WWPDB working group on deposition standards and representation. Uh, this group is currently chaired by um, Paul Adams and in the last few years has made some uh, very significant uh, ad advancements in terms of standardizing data from, for uh, deposition. Uh, the group is currently working on delivering standards recommendations for uh, a more robust description of uh, chemical restraints, uh, as well as the reorganization of our packaging and delivery of processed, uh, processed uh, structure factor data and intensities. That will include uh, uh, a, largely a reorganization of, of how that data um, is identified um, and uh, the contents of each data section that's delivered for an entry so that it will be clear, uh, clearer through uh, improved metadata uh, precisely what each data section contains, um, um, the role of that data section, and then how it's related to potentially other data sections that have been contributed or to the sample or crystal or to uh, the refined model. And I, as I said, that will include uh, recommendations for unmerged intensities and map coefficients. I think Tom Terwilliger will be talking more about some of these, some of these ideas um, in a subsequent talk, as well as a comprehensive representation of uh, chemical restraints that were used uh, in the refinement. So I said there was uh, a bit of hand-waving uh, with respect to some of the experimental details and the way that we're trying to address that uh, is allowing depositors to identify related experimental data. So this is just a, a quick view of the the manner in which we're doing that now. Uh, the bottom panel here shows a snapshot from the current deposition, our current deposition interface. And this is largely the ability to, to represent a DOI uh, for a particular data set and a DOI for the related meta metadata that um, might be needed to describe that associated with text descriptions of both of those data objects. And as many of those as need be can be entered. Um, so uh, this is our uh, current strategy. And this could be used, uh, or actually is being used now, to link data to uh, uh, a sample of archives here. Um, Vladek described his new work on the protein diffraction archive. Uh, TARDIS has been around for quite a while, and then in other areas we uh, provide linkages for NMR data, um, SAS data, and uh, primary data, and uh, processed volume data uh, for electron microscopy. So let me end with um, um, a view of the direction that uh, we are trying to move in currently. Um, and 
this is reflected in a recent paper that uh, uh, was the res result describing a, um, a working group workshop um, on hybrid and integrated methods. And the idea is the, um, that one path forward uh, for dealing with a very uh, diverse set of data resources is to think of these data resources uh, as, uh, as loosely coupled, uh, but having the ability to exchange data uh, at whatever level of detail is appropriate between resources based on shared metadata standards. And uh, in doing that, it gives each resource the opportunity to define its own standards. It doesn't impose complicated control issues between resources. It only requires that people identify the shared bits that they need to exchange. And uh, that is the, um, that's the direction that uh, we are currently working in right now. And based on our experience, we think that um, this is a, a, a useful model forward. So uh, finally, I'd like to thank the, uh, the other members of uh, the WWPDB, which we collaborate with, um, and the various uh, organizations within uh, NSF and NIH that fund the PDB in the US. So thanks very much. So uh, very practically for current conventional methods uh, to be able to have a robust enough data representation that is populated by the software packages that are um, our primary data generators that um, the use of sort of a web form based interface is no longer necessary so that you have basically a simple um, one button kind of deposition system and this is increasingly uh, increasingly with larger and more complicated structures that have complicated uh, require complicated descriptions of chemistry the lack of having that information accurately encoded uh, electronically on the front end puts a huge burden on the uh, on the depositor uh, to deliver that data. Uh, more broadly, uh, we're looking at having experiments with data sets coming from a variety of different experimental techniques and the ability to represent the structural restraints that are required to assess the quality of those structures um, 
link those restraints back to the primary data sets in this federated model uh, is sort of the sort of the next uh, the next generation of what will be what are, what we believe will be required to support structural biology. Okay, so I, I will speak then. Uh, the WWPDB is focused on the data input pipeline and delivering data into the uh, into a, a, a repository with a common representation. Um, on the delivery side, um, I I think it's quite clear that the user community is going to want to see the best version of a particular um, biological model, structural biology model. And uh, being able to deliver data with assessment, with quality assessment that's understandable to a non-specialist community is something that we are, uh, that we're all trying to achieve. Uh, that's embodied in the presentation, the simplified presentation of validation information that uh, is being provided currently. And it's anticipated that that will evolve, uh, uh, that will evolve significantly uh, in, in coming years. Uh, so that, uh, and the ability to, to better support multiple interpretations of data sets and all, all of those sorts of things will certainly uh, challenges that the PDB will be addressing. Thank you. So thank you very much again, John, for uh, an excellent and thought-provoking presentation. Thank you for taking the trouble to be with us across the Atlantic. And uh, I look forward to meeting up again in person before very much longer. Thanks okay. Again. Thanks, Brian. Bye.